running a couple minutes by on schedule. I just have a couple minutes to introduce Christine Varney, our next speaker. She's a lawyer at Cravath, Wayne and Moore, but she was formerly the U.S. Assistant Attorney General and head of the Antitrust, and I've known her since she was at the Federal Trade Commission. I don't think anyone else has held both positions. Um, but we, when she came in, we were talking about, we go all the way back to issues that she confronted at the Federal Trade Commission. She's a, Michael called her a lawyer's lawyer. I call her an internet lawyer in the sense she's always committed herself to openness, privacy, getting rid of spam, uh, uh, in the middle of the browser wars, always with a, trying to bring a light touch of regulation uh, to the internet and apply our laws in a way that has to maintain and keep an open internet. Um, Christine Varney, come on up and tell us about the state of competition. Thank you so much, Jerry, and thank you and Tim for all of the terrific work you do. And although Michael has left, I hope he will get the report back that we are all so proud of him and Secretary Clinton for the terrific work that they're doing around the world protecting and promoting human rights. Um, I'm going to talk about something a bit more mundane, and I'm not going to talk for too long because I'd much rather open it up for questions and conversations. Since I no longer work for the government, I can say whatever I think, so I think you'd probably be more interested. Uh, in, in answers to questions than remarks. But let me start by saying, Jerry and Tim asked me to come and talk about competition uh, and the internet, and kind of one of the questions that I always get in my job are, uh, revolves around are the antitrust laws in the United States sufficient to deal with the technology questions? And my answer is, it's the same question that was asked 10, 15, and 20 years ago, and it's the same answer, and that is, most of the time, they're good enough. And when I look at the challenges that are confronting you all today who work on the Hill and deal with the incredibly important questions uh, that come to you on these matters, particularly, I think today your, your big issue is probably SOPA, you know, you look back over the years, and I was just asking my, my friend and colleague, Mary Ellen, do you remember the clipper chip wars? And you can go back, the clipper chip, the browser, CDA, ECPA, and the job of Congress is pretty tough because you have these very important competing interests. And your job is to come up with the right answer for most of the people, most of the time. And unlike the Supreme Court, I do not believe that corporations are people, but corporations do have shareholders and do have employees. So balancing those important interests is, is incredibly difficult and time consuming in that the arc of the conversation is usually quite long. So what I'd like to talk a little bit is about the fact that you know we talked about um, export control on encryption it was the most controversial topic in Washington, I think, in the internet in the early 90s. And, you know, if those of you are under probably 35 in the room, you may not even know what those clipper chip uh, controversies were about. We moved on from clipper chip. We had a number of other controversies. The ones that I was mostly involved in were privacy, and we had a decade-long conversation about privacy. It's still alive, but it's certainly not as controversial as it was then. And as Jerry alluded to, you know, at the time I happened to be serving in the government, I was in the Federal Trade Commission, and my view was that regulation cannot keep up with technology. And what technology, and particularly in the internet, does, it always finds its way around a bottleneck. So I asked Jerry and the Center for Democracy and Technology, come up with some, some effective ways that give people control over their information. And Jerry took on the challenge, and that's where a lot of the original uh, privacy principles that had been you know, hashed out earlier in Europe and in HH HHS kind of migrated their way over to the internet and eventually have found their way not only into standard practice but into some legislation. And I think that was a, a good tra trajectory. It gave industry enough ramp room to come up with some solutions. At the same time, we recognized, and this is why antitrust is important, antitrust can protect uh, competition where there are markets. I would submit to you, after 20 years, I think most of us have concluded, there is no market for privacy. 
So government's obligation, if privacy is a societal goal that we all agree upon, is to come up with solutions that protect most of the people most of the time. Same thing, I think, can be said about antitrust as we, and competition as we move into looking at a variety uh, of issues in the internet. You know, if you, you hearken back uh, again to the mid-90s, the government started looking at Microsoft. And competition or antitrust in the United States, outside of the, the um, criminal cartel stuff, really has two paths that, that they work. One is when you have a dominant firm or single firm that has market power legitimately obtained and what are the obligations of that firm once it has market power to behave. And the Supreme Court and our laws have set up some from pretty clear standards on how you have to behave when you, when you achieve a monopoly. The other path is, of course, mergers. And let me talk about both for a second. In 1997, uh, the Microsoft case had been moving around for a while, it started at the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, that Federal Trade Commission deadlocked two to two on whether or not to take any action. It went over to the Antitrust Division under Ann Bingham. And, and Netscape was the uh, principal outside complainant at that time. And I had left the government and I became Netscape's lawyer. And one of the things that we did was we went up to the Hill to try to explain to members, senators, and, and congressmen that were interested in the matter what were the issues? And I'll never forget walking into a Senate office and a senator picked up the mouse and said, now tell me how this browser works and why it's important. And that was in 1997. What we went on to see is that there was great scrutiny on a great American corporation. Microsoft has done a tremendous amount of innovation. They've brought great things uh, to the internet and to the world at large but we saw scrutiny of some of their business practices and the government alleged that some of those business practices went beyond the bounds of uh, what was permitted by the law. And I would submit to you that if the government had not taken that path and if Microsoft had been able to continue to innovate by bringing competing technologies into the operating system, which was essentially the crux of the argument in the browser wars, were the bra was the browser something that could compete with an operating system and was it an unfair uh, use of market power for Microsoft to incorporate the browser into the operating system? If the government had not taken the path that it did and ultimately reached a resolution with Microsoft about how they would innovate and behave in the future, you might have had search incorporated into the operating system. Now, I think that the intervention by the government in the, um, in the browser wars was a little bit uh, late and a little bit light and uh, eventually was overtaken by, by innovation. Government legislation or government intervention is always going to ha lag behind technology. But the concepts of keeping the market free for competition are the ones that I think we need to focus on as we move forward. If you look at the tra trajectory of issues that we've cared about in the internet, I can, I, tell you that at one point we cared a lot about privacy. Today we care a lot about piracy and it's gone back and forth and it's not a neat, neat division. I think one of the things that you're going to see next are, are deep um, examination of patents. So looking forward for a minute, what people I think need to be concerned about is how can an aggregation of patents in a single company block innovation? Is that, an, is that a patent problem? Is that an antitrust problem? Is it a problem at all? Do we believe that who can ever go out and grab patents and create patents and buy patent portfolios that that's the way the system works? Does the aggregation of patents block innovation or does it spur innovation? I think these are incredibly difficult questions that no one has an answer to, but that the antitrust authorities in the United States have to look at quite regularly. And I want to touch on three cases that uh, were in front of me when I was the Assistant Attorney General and then open it up for questions because I, I do think that's probably the more interesting part of the conversation. Not all of these are directly on the internet. There was uh, Ticketmaster's acquisition of Live Nation, Google's acquisition of ITA, and of course Comcast's acquisition of NBC Universal. In those three cases, what you saw is what I think confronts the, the, the antitrust enforcers worldwide today. It was not mergers that were straight, clean, horizontal competitors. 
widget manufacturer A is trying to buy widget manufacturer B, and there's only one other widget manufacturer, and they have very little market share. That's a straightforward horizontal merger that under our laws is not permitted. The three cases that I've mentioned were not straight horizontal mergers, although each of them uh, probably had not so much Google ITA, but the other two had a little bit of, of uh, horizontal component. They're what's called in the competition world vertical mergers. So you had entities that are in a supply chain, they don't compete directly against each other, and they go to merge. And under what circumstances are those mergers pro-competitive, and on, under what circumstances do those mergers violate the antitrust laws and result in a diminution of competition and a resultant uh, potential increase in price or decrease in output or slowing of innovation? These are the tough questions that face competition authorities today. And I think what we tried to do when I was at the Department of Justice was cut a path that acknowledged there were pro-competitive benefits from these combinations, but there were serious anti-competitive concerns that had to be addressed. So in each one of these transactions, we put in place a series of conduct restrictions, as well in some of them we required a bit of divestiture, that were designed to maintain an open and competitive playing field. The most talked about example is probably Comcast NBCU, where you had the country's largest cable provider acquiring one of the country's largest content providers. And there were concerns at all levels, but there was a very big concern about how do online video distributors like Netflix or Walmart, if it wanted to get into the business, or Hulu, or Jerry Berman from West Virginia creating his own content. How do they get access to these cable systems? And if you can't get on one of the cable systems, then you can't get on any of them. And there was a concern, I think a correct concern, that what you'd begin to see was an aggregation and a blocking of um, the ability to develop and monetize independent content. So we were very concerned about that. We were also very concerned about the fact that broadband competition is becoming increasingly concentrated. In virtually every market in the United States, you'll have either a cable provider and a telephone, an, an old telco provider with a twisted copper or satellite. Satellite latency really doesn't work. Um, for the, the broadband applications that we're seeing. So we we're very concerned that Comcast would have both the ability and the incentive to discriminate against other potential broadband uh, providers in any market they were in. So we put a number, working very closely with the Federal Communications Commission, we put a number of conditions in the consent that required Comcast to keep a, a portion of the broadband uh, reserved for the open internet. We tied it to the technical specs that the FCC had developed, which was an interesting kind of sidebar here, uh, also in AT&T. The DOJ and the FCC worked in an unprecedentedly close manner. It was the first time we ever took advantage of the internet and collected all of the documents and information electronically and with the party's consent allowed both agencies to access the documents, to work from the documents. We had combined joint case teams that worked collaboratively, so we tried to you know, uh, do what we preach and harness the, the ability to work collaboratively to get to the right result. In Comcast NBC, uh, as well as Ticketmaster and Google ITA, I think if you take a look at those consent decrees, you also see something a little innovative, at least in the, in the last two, which is we uh, put in what's called baseball-style arbitration. That was an idea that if a party believes that the merged company is violating its consent decree, the, the aggrieved party can invoke baseball-style arbitration where, um, I'm not a baseball fan, but as I understand it, you go in and you present your side, the other party presents their side, and they're both kind of put their best offer in front of the arbitrator, and the arbitrator picks one. There's no kind of splitting the baby. So the idea is that it incents everybody to get to the middle pretty quickly. Um, we'll see if this works. It hasn't really been done before. It hasn't been done, a baseball-style arbitration hasn't been done at DOJ. But again, it's trying to get the mechanisms of the market to work so that the financial incentives of each company will drive what their offers are as they go into baseball-style arbitration. What you really hope is that they never get there. 
that they resolve any disputes they have commercially, but short of that, that there is a mechanism, rather than a 10-year-long government investigation that results in a solution that is way past its prime in addressing the problem. So keep your eye on that and see if that open, uh, see how that works. And finally, I would say keep your eye on, on the patent wars. They're what's coming. Um, I think you see this in a couple of the investigations that have been reported upon that are at the Department of Justice right now. Um, it's clearly an issue in a couple of the mergers, I think, that DOJ is looking at, and I'm gone. I don't know how they're going to resolve it, but it is a very tough question. So with that, um, Jerry, if we have time, why don't I open it up for a few questions? If anybody has it. No questions? <laughs> Can't be true. Former government official who can say whatever they want. <laughs> um, I wanted to just ask you a little bit more. I know you talked about piracy. Oh, I'm sure. Rob Smith, Net Pioneers. Um, you talked about um, piracy, but also privacy. Right. And it seems to me that actually privacy is as much a concern now as 10 years ago. 15 years ago or even 30 years ago, given the development of technology, the ability to locate where we all are in an instant, uh, the ability to store vast amounts of data. It, and when you look at what I kids consider my kids' generation, have no sense of um, concern about privacy, it seems to me. It seems like it should be a more, greater concern than, than e ever before. Your comments. Yeah, I think that. The, the difficult thing about privacy, as, as I said earlier, is that there's really no marketplace for privacy. It's not that individuals uh, or groups of individuals outside of the good work that Mark Rotenberg does at Epic and um, the ACLU and, uh, and obviously um, what Jerry did at CDT, you don't have this huge demand for privacy. So. To me, I used to, to say, and I, I still believe, it's a little bit like environmental degradation. You know, you can go out and you can pollute the environment and you don't really bear the cost of that as the polluter. But when you go, and it affects everyone in the vicinity, but when you go to try and remediate that degradation, it's very hard to get back to the state prior to the degradation. I would say the same thing is true with privacy. And it's not until there is a consensus that privacy is a societal value that the market is unable to achieve and therefore government must step in with the solution or the, the series of solutions and protections that you're going to get much traction. And I just don't see the demand for it. I mean, nobody is marching on Congress demanding that their data be kept public and uh, private and not mined and not monetized. It's not, it's not a property right. I think we've seen the court rule again and again. You don't have a property right in your own data, so you can't monetize it. You don't have a contractual right other than in situations where you do enter into a, a contract, which are pretty limited around your data. You know, I wonder if the path forward in thinking about getting more privacy around data doesn't involve health and medical data. And the institutional interests are arrayed against kind of individual control of your own health and, and medical data. But at the same time, the technology, I think, is moving very quickly that we will reach a point where we can all own and control and distribute and control the distribution <coughs> of our own health and medical data. I wonder if when that happens, we might be edging more towards a tipping point on the control of data. I think your observation about young people is absolutely right. They have very little sense of the, the consequence of having no private life, no, no inner life. There, I wrote an article a long time ago in Newsweek in the 90s where I talked about the global village and that my family came from a very small um, community, very small town in Ireland called Belly Bunyan. And in Bally Bunyan, it's very, very small, and when my grandparents were growing up there, and all my cousins still live there, everybody knew who the town drunk was. Everybody knew who had a child with special needs. Everybody knew who was not necessarily uh, 
staying within the confines of their marriage. Everybody knew which priest might be a problem. But that knowledge was used in the context of community. And there were consequences for abusing that knowledge. So you may know who the town drunk was, but that knowledge was used to make sure when the pub closed, people were there who got him or her back to his house and didn't leave him sleeping on the side of the street. So, you know, not all through time has, has that kind of knowledge been used beneficially, but I do think there's this sense when you have a lot of knowledge about everyone, everywhere, in real time, without consequence, is when you have a, the beginning of a disintegration of a lot of civil values. Yeah. Hi, Gary Arlen from Arlen Communications. Hi. Hi. Uh, last week was the 30th anniversary of the modified final judgment, breaking up that old bell system. And I could right. ask you loads of questions about right. that <laughs> in context of the uh, AT&T T-Mobile. But I'd rather ask you, inspired by uh, Ambassador Posner's question, uh, comments just now, about your interest in patents. And what about patents in a truly global world where inventions and creation and innovation is coming from all over the world and competing in various ways with domestic mm -hmm. uh, patent issues? Could you talk a little bit about the international patent arrangement? <clears throat> I think that in the same way that we have to think about how patents can be used offensively to diminish competition and innovation, we have to think about ways to strengthen patent protection to protect innovation. And it's a very tricky balance. You know, you think your, your piracy uh, debate that is going to be happening in this Congress is tough. Where do you get to patents? Because in patents, I think that the it is not, obviously it isn't in any kind of uh, debate, a binary debate, but I think the complications in a global world where we are networked, where commerce knows no boundaries, and you have to have an international rule of law, patents are going to be particularly problematic because they can be used both offensively and defensively. So the question becomes, when are patents being abused? And until we are ready to examine the potential for abuse of patents in our system, I think it's gonna be very hard to impose in a global framework rules that apply across borders. So I think there's a, a, a big conversation that's gotta happen both at WIPO and in the United States Congress on how we are going to view patents in an increasingly global, interconnected world without boundaries. And, and I don't pretend to have the answer on that. I can tell you that my guess is it will be the biggest debate, it, probably two years from now, occupying the Congress's, uh, in the internet, occupying the, the Congress's attention. I wish I had a better answer. I can just see it coming. <laughs> One last question. Over sure. Here. Hi, Tim Lee with Ars Technica. Um, related to the, the previous question, I wonder if you could comment about, um, there's been some accusations that I think Google has made against um, some of its uh, competitors in the cell phone space that um, several of them would get together and buy a large um, portfolio of patents essentially to prevent uh, Google, which didn't at that point have very many patents, from getting its own sort of arsenal of patents. And I wonder if this sort of acquiring, you know, really large, it's not really about individual technologies so much as just sort of having a, a huge thicket of patents where you, you always have the ability to uh, sue pretty much anybody. I wonder if this, this process of sort of the people who have a lot of patents buying up the remaining patents to prevent newcomers from getting their hands on any, if those raise um, competition issues, and if, if so, sort of what should be done about that. Sure. It's probably the most interesting issue that the, the um, antitrust enforcers are looking at today. And from, you know, I hate to get really technical, but from an antitrust perspective, it depends entirely on how you define the market. And a, a short detour might be illustrative here. Remember when we had the huge financial crisis and everybody talked about, you know, it's a too big to fail problem. And there was this chatter on the sidelines about, well, if it's too big to fail, why isn't antitrust the answer? Well, the reason that the financial crisis was not um, amenable to an antitrust analysis was, in my view, what you had was a systemic failure of these institutions that had, engaged, had been allowed to engage in multiple businesses after we repealed Glass-Steagall. 
So you had institutions that were now traditional SNLs. They were commercial banks. They were investment advisors. They were underwriters. They were insurers. So they had become, they had permeated many, many lines of commerce so that when one part of the um, institution was beginning to fail, the, the reaction was systemic. That's not an antitrust problem because each one of those streams of commerce is an individual antitrust market. So there's no going in and saying, you know, the, any kind of standard of behavior that has to be imposed here from an antitrust perspective because they weren't dominant in any particular antitrust market. And I relate that because it's very, it will help you understand what I think the patents issues are in, in, in any um, particular stream of commerce that you're looking at. If you have an entity that is engaged in innovation and is engaged in creating a current product as well as a future product, at what point does the accumulation of patent rights itself become a market? That is an untested antitrust question. I think the best precedent you can look to is in drug companies. When you look at drug company mergers and you look at innovation market analysis, you begin to get a sense that yes, antitrust can define a market for future innovation. And if the aggregation of patents in one entity's hands prevents future innovation, I suspect you may have an antitrust issue. The problem is with patents, as Donald Rumsfeld famously said, you don't know what you don't know. So theoretically, there will always be innovation around a, a patent holder's future product. It's a very tricky question. I don't know where the government will go, come out. I certainly don't know where the courts will come out when these issues start to be litigated. But I would ref I look at innovation market analysis in the, in the drug company space and you'll get the beginning of a roadmap of how you might think about it. All right, thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Christine. Thank you. I want to turn the program over to, to Tim and thank Christine once more. And one yes and no question, Christine. In 90% of the cases, whether, whatever we were dealing with, privacy, piracy, uh, ECPA, the consensus has to be developed, and it has to be developed in this room. It's a multi-stakeholder consensus. Congress will debate it, but they'll eventually turn around to this community and say, give me the solution. And that solution is going to require everyone to get in a room and solve it. And I think our next panel sets that up uh, very well, because that's where we are. Thank you very much.